Thank you so much for your time, Professor, and thank you for coming today. So, uh, first of all, I'd just like to start off with some conventional questions on um, effective altruism, per se. So, one of the most popular attacks on EA, per se, is the claim that it is excessively focused on the individual and doesn't necessarily talk about structural level overhaul or structural level changes, because precisely for its need to emphasise that the ability of every individual to do something, that might ironically also neglect the prospects for collective sort of unionisation or collective movement on the part of individuals and overcoming these problems in society. Do you think that's a fair critique of EA and what are your thoughts on that in general? I suppose it's um, understandable that people would uh, make that critique <coughs> given uh, a lot of the emphasis of what people in EA should do. But there's no necessary connection uh, between the fact that you're appealing to individuals and saying, what should you do? To saying, and what you should do is help other individuals and not change the structure, right? Mm -hmm. Because it might be that what you ought to do is to work together with some large group that is seeking to change the structure, if, if that is what gives you the best chance of making a difference. In other words, what gives you the greatest expected value from your actions. Now, it remains to be seen whether that's so. And some people would prefer the fact that they can, with high confidence, um, save lives or restore sight or um, in other, other ways improve the living of people in extreme poverty, rather than that they can take a long shot chance on changing some big structure which will help millions of people. But that's entirely open to looking at the evidence. I think that's very fair, although I would observe that perhaps the pushback against that is that Suppose that I think or I operate under the expected probability subjectively that no one else in society would be willing to undertake the same particular action P that translates to if 100 people do it, a structural level change, and therefore I don't participate in it. And it is precisely because of that subjective expectation of others not participating in it that I also don't engage in it. Then wouldn't you think that the logic you propose just then has a potentially self-effacing element to it in the sense that if everyone starts thinking in that sort of expected or subjective expected uh, utility manner. You end up with a world where folks defer to what they think is most likely and that's why none of them ever partake in these arguably more radical actions because they don't expect others to be willing to jump on board as well. Well, but that just that, that, that's not to do with effective altruism as such. That's to do with the situation um, and the fact that it's difficult to organise people if people think that the chances of success are low. Um, so... I think that's a, that, that's a fact about the world and, and maybe it only shows that you need to work harder to convince other people that there is a real chance that if we all work together we'll have this big change. Because I think that's a very fair point because one of the pushbacks I guess to that is the feeling that when you speak excessively in terms of expected utility you might neglect the prospects of say the indeterminate uh, room for moral imagination where you might actually be, it might be a good thing that you hypothetically expect to be a greater chance than there actually is at certain projects or particular ventures succeeding in order to get people to jump on board into the first place. The case in point might be startups or joining into a particular charity relief effort where realistically you need hundreds of thousands of people to like save or stop a particular village from starving. But in the absence of being told that there might be a high chance of that succeeding and as the end goal, people might just not sign up because they don't think they would be the one that contributes marginally significant effort or utility in that case. Yeah, I have to say that observing movements over the last few decades, I don't see that. I see people willing to sign up to things that have very small chances. Um, for example, a lot of effort has gone into the Occupy movement um, with very little return. Um, so people were willing to sign up for it despite very low expectations of, of success. Um, arguably, people's bias goes the other way. They're more ready to sign up to do things collectively because they want to say, hey, I'm part of this movement, I'm one of the good guys. Um, and in fact, it would be a lot better if they spent their time and energy helping individuals. Um, because they, you know, in the case of the Occupy movement, I think a lot more would have come out of it, in fact. I think that's a fair point. And, and I actually think that critique you had about this the fixation or fetish of fetishization of working in cohorts or groups seems to be a phenomenon that's playing out across some manifestations, not all of them, but some versions of effective altruism movements in certain countries or regions of the world. And there's an allegation that like the EA movement has deviated from what you originally intended for it to, to look like and be. Do you think that's a fair characterization? Or? 
Um, there are parts of the EA movement that have moved away from the concrete issues where we clearly can make a difference, like global poverty, to, um, to what's known as long-termism um, yeah. and existential risk. Um, uh, like, I think those things are important. I don't want to say nobody should work on that. Um, yes, I, I do think that perhaps the EA movement has moved too far and, and arguably there's now too much in the way of resources going into a rather speculative long-termism um, when I would like to see just a bit of a, sh a shift, swing back of the pendulum. I, I wouldn't like to see people stop working on existential risk. But um, I think, yeah, there are, there are more concrete things with where I would like to see the EA movement focus a lot more, in part because I think it'll bring in a lot more people. I think if we continue to focus on long-term things and concern ourselves with the possibility of AI taking over in a uh, malevolent way, um, it's going to be a very narrow movement. There's a very limited number of people who are really going to commit their lives to that, uh, as compared with the numbers that might commit their lives to helping people in extreme poverty or trying to reduce the suffering of animals in factory farms, um, you know, those more immediate sorts of issues. Do you think that following from that, that your sort of distinction or preference of focusing on current issues is a more sort of pragmatically rooted one based on the ability to appeal to individuals is in a more sort of substantively normative commitment that you think present generation sufferings or the suffering of present generation ultimately matters to some extent more than future generations in that extent? Uh, I think it's more pragmatic really. Um, I, I certainly don't hold the view that present generations matter more than future generations per se. Mm. Um, Clearly there are discounts for uncertainty when you get into the future and the further into the future you get the greater those discounts. Um, there's also a question, a, a difficult normative question that I've not fully resolved my views on as to how great a tragedy it is if um, there aren't future generations. Right? So in other words, I, I'm, I'm pretty clear that if there's a sentient being X who exists in let's say 2500, um, the, the well-being of that sentient being is just as important as the well-being of someone existing today. Um, now, as I said, you discount for uncertainty, mm -hmm. but if, we, if, we, if we're postulating that that being will certainly exist in 500 years' time, there's no reason for discounting, you know, pure time discounting. Um, but uh, if, if it's possible that the, that being simply will not exist at all, mm. um, and therefore will have neither happiness nor misery, does that count as, is, is that as bad as if uh, a being who is existing and is happy now um, does not exist for the same number of years as that being would exist? That's, that's the difficult issue for me. That so so that's the asymmetry, it. if I'm right to that, that that's the it's, a, it's a kind of asymmetry, that's right. Um, the asymmetry of the not bringing future beings into existence who could be happy yeah. as compared with um, the wrongness of beings who definitely will exist who will be unhappy. So just to probe you on that actually, so do you think that that comparison is, so there are two ways of reading that asymmetry and that a strong version of that is that it is just morally neutral, value neutral for us to not introduce any like utility positive existences into being because as in it's just an, a point of indifference or we shouldn't be particularly committed to either side of that particular issue, or is it more like a weak version of asymmetry where it's probably far more desirable that an existent being does not suffer into the future, or you don't bring into existence uh, an impaired being, or to avoid doing that as compared with, say, bringing into an existence uh, a positive or utility positive individual, which may or may not still be morally important, but just far less important in avoiding suffering. In that sense, do, do you see? So I, I don't hold the first view anyway. Um, I don't hold the view that it's a matter of indifference um, whether we bring into existence uh, a happy being. Yeah. Um, I, I I think that, that is positive to some extent. Um, what I'm not really sh sure, of, you know, it's difficult. I think to find a a clear, coherent view that doesn't have pretty strongly counterintuitive consequences is. Uh, whether bringing into existence a happy being is just as good as um, changing an existing being's life, let's say, from neutral into into a happy one. Um, uh, you know, I, I have, I guess, in, in terms of trying to find a coherent, consistent view, a total view, which does imply that 
it's just as important to bring happy beings into existence as to make existing beings happy. Um, does, uh, you know, that, that's a coherent and consistent view. It um, can lead to the well-known repugnant conclusion, yeah. which, um, you know, I and most people would, would prefer to avoid, but on the other hand, probably, you know, more than most people, I'm willing to accept counterintuitive uh, implications. So maybe that is still the best view, but um, I, I haven't given up on the idea that there's a coherent alternative view. I mean, actually, on that, I'm, I'm going to segue into the section I planned for later, but it, it seems to me that Parfit's last article before he passed away mentions the idea that you can reject the Republican conclusion of sort of more broadly levelling down on the basis that there, there's a mixed conception of value or that some value in the world can be personal and some value can be impersonal. And the impersonal value may or may not sometimes outweigh the personal sort of value, but at the very same time, you can introduce principles like a minimum sufficientarian baseline that kind of caveats out the undesirable aspects of a problem conclusion, which seems to offer a way out for a lot of those seeking to reconcile a Republican conclusion with not exactly full and extreme utilitarianism or sort of totalism per se, but also they don't want to necessarily collapse back into averageism. You know, that might be the third pathway for them in dealing with the Republican conclusion. Yeah, I, I certainly don't think that the average view works, but... Um... Um, I I wasn't really persuaded by uh, Papert's um, uh, final posthumously published article on on that. Uh, I wasn't persuaded about the personal impersonal. I guess I'm a, tend to be an, an impersonalist about uh, value. Um, also, wasn't really persuaded about having some sort of minimum standard on how you would justify that. But, um, you know, as I say, but they're difficult issues, and um, I haven't really been working on them very much in recent years because I felt that I wasn't getting anywhere before and there were other things that I could more usefully spend my time on. And this actually ties me onto this section on utilitarianism, so I think that's a good yeah. point to sort of jump into it. Because um, you mentioned just then that you're more sort of an impersonal theorist to some degree about value in that sense. Um, so I, I suppose my first challenge would be, um, do you think that the best defence of utilitarianism is presumably an impersonal account to some extent, but what do you think actually is the strongest theoretical defence of utilitarianism as, as a framework out there? You mean if you're trying to persuade somebody... Yeah, just someone who is undecided right. or trying to learn about moral philosophy but right. not really set on anything yet. So I think one, um, you know, one thing is that uh, pursuing pleasure or happiness and avoiding pain or misery is something that we all do. Um, and... You can therefore argue that why is this more important for you? You know, why is it more important that you don't suffer pain than that you or you or you don't suffer pain? Um, and I think a lot of people can see that uh, if we're really thinking ethically, we ought not just to be thinking about my pain, but pain more generally, pleasure more generally. So there's an argument that says, well, this is clearly seems to be a value. Now then, of course, the other thing is people might say, yes, but you know, there's these absolute rights that you must not violate, or there's these rules, or there's these prima facie duties, or there's these uh, lexical principles, or yeah. whatever it might be. Um, and I think that the only way to respond to that is in detail about each argument and each claim. So I think part of the strength of utilitarianism is the critique of alternatives to it, and you know, where do these rights come from? How do you know that these rights are absolute? Why are these rights absolute and not these ones? Uh, you know, are you really sure that you wouldn't torture one innocent person to prevent a nuclear war that killed hundreds of millions and made them all made hundreds of millions more suffer? You know, those sorts of questions I think are the challenges you need to put to people who are inclined to accept the idea that, yes, sure, pain is bad, that's a bad thing, but you know, we have these other moral principles that we need to give way to. And I actually want to sort of just follow up on that, and that sort of the fragmentation of value argument from, I think, uh, Thomas Nagel, effectively with the view that he thinks there are certain incommensurable baseline goods that are never, uh, to a certain degree, fungible with each other. So, for instance, my pursuit or defence of my bodily autonomy might not be easily fungible with you just paying me cash if you punch me in the face or if you cut off a limb of mine even if you can pay me millions of dollars 
to compensate me in terms of my utilitarian or utility-centric losses. And the underlying assumption there is that there's a plurality of goods in which we would prefer to have a bundle of a mixture of them as opposed to all of them being reduced into a single monistic conception of utility. Wouldn't, be, wouldn't that basically be the justification for certain inviolable rights in the sense that if I accept that there's a plurality of possible goods out there and not all of them is just utility and suppose an action maximises utility but not any of these other say x1, x2, x3 parts of the components or bundles of the good, they might say in these cases the other conceptions of the good would outweigh or constrain against the maximisation of x1 as the only value here. And maybe that's the answer or justification of rights that actually stems from a broad consequentialist but not necessarily utilitarian framework. Well firstly it's not clear from uh, plurality of values whether you end up with uh, some being absolute rights rather than a pluralistic consequentialism mm. with um, you know, not utilitarianism but uh, plurality of values. But um, I think the general problem with the idea that there are incommensurable values, whether it's a form of consequentialism or whether it tries to take a, a rights form, um, is that it doesn't really give any kind of coherent answer to how you want to balance them off, right? I mean, if they're incommensurable, um, that means that you know whatever the values are, you know, let's say it's it's autonomy and and uh, utility understood in hedonistic terms. Um, then uh, it seems that if somebody says, you know, the, the most trivial exercise of autonomy is worth any amount of suffering, mm -hmm. um, you can't say that that's wrong because they're just incommensurable. Uh, and I think that does, means that you, you have a view that doesn't really give us any guidance. Um, whenever, whenever any of these incommensurable values clash, um, there's no guidance at all. Any, any way of resolving the clash is as good as any other. I suppose a modified version of that thought would be a claim of, sort of underdetermination in that. I accept what you said about the sort of deadlocks and standstill when you, when you accept incommensurability, you can't necessarily compare across values, but it seems that of all this base values or base conceptions or that you can reduce or collapse these conceptions of a good into, there, there seems to be a plurality of choices you can choose from. So you can have, say, you can reduce everything into the currency or utility and happiness or you know, reduce everything into terms of autonomy, or even if you're more sort of into the, the conceptions of like trying to integrate Kantianism into consequentialism, you might say actually it's the preservation of dignity and autonomy that is maximally important independent of happiness. And it seems that there's always a way for me to describe a trade off within another framework to base currency of utility that is equally as viable as utility as that base comparison unit. So I suppose that's the modified version of this question. Mm -hmm. Now, don't you think there's an indeterminacy problem and therefore many utilitarians would want to do a bit more than just to say, you know, pain is universally disliked or rejected and happiness is universally preferred, but maybe there are other goods or other pairs and dyads that are equally universally dispreferred and preferred that utilitarians have to distinguish between uh, happiness or utility from or in comparison against that might be worth further clarificatory work in that sense. Uh, you know, it might be. Um, I think you would need to try to say you know, what these other ones are and uh, you, know, you still need to say something about the trade-offs or the, the bundles of values. Um, I'm not saying that you know, <coughs> I can easily dispose of mm -hmm. any possible such combination. Some of them might be quite plausible. Um, if you can show some good reason, you know, like uh, Parfit talked to, well, it was more who talked about organic unities and yes. things holes being better than others, and Parfit seemed to have some sympathy with that view itself. So certainly there are, there are other very good philosophers who, mm -hmm. who think that that's uh, a plausible view. Um, and I'm not saying that, uh, that there's a simple refutation. That's very, very fair. And on that note, actually, how do you think, what, what do you think of Parfit's, um, well, on what matters, actually, that there was... As a whole. Widely discussed extensively yeah. in Oxford yeah. and they're not up to this publication. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, well, widely discussed not just in Oxford, I think, but uh, over a lot of the world because he circulated those drafts uh, very widely. Um, I, think it's a, I think it's a splendid work, I have to say. Um, uh, there are many different things in it. Um, I suppose the two main things that I take out of it are uh, the argument for triple theory. Yes. Um, 
which gets somewhat modified in the in the third volume, I have to say. Um, and the argument uh, for objective values. Um, and I think actually that the argument for objective values is a, a, a greater achievement. I think, mm -hmm. I think that's a really powerful argument and I think uh, Parfit has challenged a lot of other philosophers uh, who assume that there aren't really objective values in the strong sense that he wants um, there to be objective values. Um, and uh, talks about the importance of this uh, with this claim that uh, you know, his life is meaningless and uh, your life and my life, I guess, is also meaningless if there are no objective values. That's a, a strong, challenging claim, which a lot of philosophers have rejected. Um, but I think he's, he's done something to, to recenter that debate. So he's, he's shifted it over and put more, you know, more of a weight on the side that says, you know, yes, we can defend objective values uh, and put more of a challenge to those people that he criticizes. So that's, that's, I think, a big achievement. Um, the triple theory, I think, is interesting, and I think along the way there are some really good things in that. I really like the section on, on Kant, in which he argues that you know, there's really, to be defensible, Kant has to give up a lot of the things that a lot of Kantians would, would say really are true to Kant. Um, uh, and there's, there are good specific arguments there that I think Kantians need to, to grapple with. Um, I, um, I was troubled by the fact that act utilitarianism seemed to drop out of this, that it was a form of rule utilitarianism yeah. that was part of the triple theory. But then I, uh, in correspondence with Parfit, I was able to clarify that he hadn't really intended to say that act utilitarianism is in any way refuted, but rather that mm -hmm. he hadn't brought it in to that triple theory. And then in the third volume, he tries to show that perhaps the differences between act consequentialism and triple theory uh, less sharp than you might have thought. Um, and I'm not, I, I, I don't think that's his best work, I have to say. I'm not really convinced by that. Yeah, I think we'll get on to sort of that meta-ethical question um, in just a second. I'd like to sort of probe your thoughts on how we take your work on ethical and moral theory and apply it to, say, political obligation and political debates. Because one of the works I read of yours when I was doing my preliminary exams in PPE was, um, your work on quasi consent uh, in 1972. It's a very long time ago. Yeah, it's a very long time ago. But I, I really liked your thoughts on that, actually. I guess my only concern or question um, after reading that piece is like, would there be a possible explanatory gap between? So, so your theory effectively is that if indeed it can be reasonably expected or, or it is reasonably understood to be the case that these other folks within your political community are adhering to. A similar set of political rules, the electoral game, and they respect the decisions of the elections in general, they partake in it, that it could be reasonable for you, as amongst them, to expect that they respect or adhere to the decisions of that end outcome of that game. So you, you quote the legal doctrine of Estoppel as sort of the, the parallel analogy for that. My, my only thought, well, two thoughts is, the first one is, might that not be a case where we're conflating the reasonableness for me to expect compared with the objective reasonableness to actually expect that person to adhere to such an expected obligation. And a subsidiary concern from that is, maybe it's just supererogatory that they adhere to your expectations and what is reasonable for you to sort of expect them to do, but not necessarily morally obligatory, which means that there's still a bit of an issue with justifying obligation in its fullest extent there. So what I'm saying is we're, we're going into um uh, something in this case, let's say an election, with a reasonable expectation that others will abide by that result. Um, and given that, there is a prima facie obligation, not an absolute one, for me to respect the result as well. Right? So you're, I'm trying to see where the, the gap that you're opening up is from, from, from the, the fact that we're going into this activity with this expectation to the idea that there's a prima facie obligation? Yes, yeah, so I think it's like, um, say the two parties, A expects, reasonably speaking, that B adheres to the rules of the game and accepts the results of the election and the vote. Uh, I think there's a gap between that and saying B actually has a substantive normative obligation to respect the results of that. Right. Okay, so because this is, well, it was really, you know, the first significant work that I, that I published, uh, the first book that I published, um, I, I think 
I wasn't perhaps as clear as I might have been about um, whether this is a utilitarian argument or, or not a utilitarian argument. Um, and I think to some extent I was appealing, I suppose, to a, a sense of, of fairness that mm. um, could perhaps be given um, an indirect utilitarian justification uh, that um, you know, society works better when people yeah. believe that others are acting fairly um, and, and that's more likely to lead to peaceful resolution of disputes. So uh, it's, it's perhaps not, not that clear on, on that point. Um, I think I could say, you know, thinking now as a, more as a straightforward utilitarian, uh, that uh, it is very valuable that we solve disputes in politics yeah. peacefully rather than violently, um, and that uh, if you take part in the in the process, and if indeed it's true that others expect people to abide by mm -hmm. that verdict, um, and then you don't then that's likely to lead others also to, yep. to have recourse to violence and it's likely to weaken the sense of a commitment and an obligation to support that outcome. So and it seems to me almost that the argument there is kind of reminiscent of um, Bernard Williams' political uh, realism claim in his article where he rejects political moralism and argues that the first and foremost assumption of this stage is a question of well, we assume, presumably, that the state exists and that there is a question of political power and that there is a need for us to consider how political communities get together and assemble. So in practice, what we really should be talking about when we're talking about legitimacy or questions of ethics pertaining to the state is, is to do away with the logic of or the language of political moral, uh, what moralism altogether, but to instead focus on the political dimension and nature of questions where everyone has to live together and you have a society, you now the question is, how best do we maximise or like ensure the stability of that arrangement? Uh, and I, I suppose my question is, how do you feel about that conception of like say political anti-moralism? Well, I, I don't. The trouble is, I don't see it really as anti-moralism because if the question is how best to do this, then of course you have to say, well, best by what standards? Um, and I would then introduce utilitarian standards, which I see as moral standards. So I don't think it. it it, it can't be pure political realism uh, in the sense that political realists often mean it. That is to say, well, we're just talking about you know, nations following their own interests or communities following their interests or whatever it might be. Um, there is an underlying moral theory, yeah. I think, normative theory. And do you think utilitarianism is the best sort of general governing, what, the theory for establishing legitimate governance? Do you think that's...? I think it's in a very strong position because um, it's it, you know it goes back to what I said earlier. It is something that we can all <clears throat> that we can all agree on. Yeah. And once we start arguing about other moral conceptions, <clears throat> it's less likely that we're going to agree. So it's a kind of a common ground um, that we do this. Um, there's a book written a while ago by Bob Gooden. Um, you know that about um, uh, utility as a public. I, I don't remember the title of the book now. Do you, do you remember that? But it's yeah, about yeah. utility as a public. Philosophy, he, he uses it to sort of resolve or try and bridge the issue to do with uh, mm -hmm. neutrality or that comprehensive right. doctrines yeah. Yeah, yeah. inflicting in public. Yeah. And, uh, and Josh Green has a book called Moral Tribes where he does something similar. He asks, you know, given that we're all different moral tribes with different sets of intuitions from our culture and background, how can we work together? He's not thinking about a single political community, but globally, I guess. Um, and he's also then talks about something very much you know, welfareism of some sort, something like utilitarianism as a basis for that. That's right, fair. Because I think a lot of the stuff you mentioned just now about agreeability, it seems to me, however, is also to some extent captured by a contractualism, sort of Tim Scanlon's uh, conception of searching for the rule that no one could reasonably reject. Do you think that actually collapses into some extent of utilitarianism as the been... end output of I... that? I mean, I think the trouble with that is, is what do you mean by can reasonably reject, right? Um, arguably, uh, I can reasonably reject every rule that doesn't maximise benefits for, for all those affected. So I, I think it's, if you just do reasonably reject, it's completely open to anything. Um, if you try to argue that uh, only a certain conception is reasonable, that, you know, I have to be, um, you know, not that not made worse off that by mere aggregationism or something mm -hmm. like that, then you need more argument for why that's the case. 
Great. Now that we're going to sort of turn to the more unconventional territory in question. Right. So, uh, I guess just following on from that, I want to bring in animals here. So, um, my first question on that would be, do you think, or to what extent do you think we need a political theory for animals beyond just a you moral mean, theory? You mean like... Uh, As members of like Demos? Like Kim Laker, or sort of Kim Laker and... Um, yeah. Uh, uh, I don't, I suppose, really. Um, I don't really think that's very helpful. Um, I think that if you, I mean, in, in, in part, the point is, if you got the human community that now has all the power and makes the decisions mm -hmm. to accept that non-human animals are part of the demos, uh, they would have already accepted, I, I assume, that they have a moral status that means that we should not ignore or discount their interests. Um, and that's really all that we could do, I think, by bringing them into the demos. I suppose to push back against that might be that it's a stepwise process. That if I'm really genuinely sort of committed in that radical conception of animal rights, so animal political rights, I might say we'll start first with recognising moral status, then we'll proceed to other aspects of political, well, re reinvigorating the political and how we interact with animals there. But it, it does seem to me, as you said, it's quite plausible. It doesn't seem particularly attractive as a, as a project. Yeah, I haven't seen much sign of, of um, ability to make progress in, in that field. And do you think this inability to make progress also extends that sometimes it seems a very large number of, I suppose, cultural barriers to recognising the, the importance to mitigate against animal suffering, where it seems to me that a lot of the strongest public justifications, and I use that in air quotes because I don't think it's actually normatively backed up, against uh, your views on animal rights is just, well, we've always done it, it's what culture tells us to do, it's justified, and more advanced of that, versions of that might be, this damages a core part of our religion or culture when we can't eat meat, and that just seems to be a sort of public obstacle to a lot of the emancipatory causes you've been pushing through. Exactly. It's not only animals that that's an obstacle to. It's, um, you know, it's equality for women. It's uh, uh, ability to have same-sex relationships. Um, a lot of these things are opposed by cultural background, opposed by religious teachings. Um, and in that respect, I don't think the animals issue is different. I think the, the big difference with the animal issue is the fact that we eat them. Um, so, of course, you know, maybe it's true with the relations between men and women, and that's a, a part of everyday life as well. Um, yeah. So that's also very difficult. Um, with things relating to same-sex relationships, I suppose, really it doesn't affect most people's lives mm -hmm. that directly as changing what you eat you know, two or three times a day. Um, and uh, that's, that's something that does go very deep. Uh, and that's, I think, a, a major obstacle has been so far to change. What would be your meta-ethical outlook and worldview in general? So, so what's your meta-ethics? Well, um, you know, I, I used to be for a long time um, a non-cognitivist, uh, roughly along the lines of Hare's universal prescriptivism. But, um, but I changed. Uh, you know, under a number of influences, um, one was Parfit's arguments in um, on on what matters, uh, which of course I did see before the publication of the mm -hmm. book, as many others did. Um, so that was that was a factor. Uh, a number of discussion I had a discussion with Tom Nagel, I remember um, after a conference at New York University, which was probably about the last time that I tried to defend something like universal prescriptivism mm -hmm. and. Uh, and the idea that it, nevertheless you could have rational arguments in ethics. Um, and uh, there's also a review that Tom wrote in the uh, New York Review of Books of um, a book called Peter Singer Under Fire, which was a collection of essays about my work. Uh, and I think it was a joint review of that and something else, maybe the book about Henry Spirit called Ethics and Direction. Um, and uh, there were arguments in that that you know made me think that perhaps so so a number of different things sort of came together over a few years, um, and I began to think that the case for objective truth in ethics was stronger than I had accepted before. Do you think that sort of what are your thoughts on say this the almost um, 
I would characterize as a semi cop out argument. I think it's quite interesting, a sort of a quasi realism approach to defending the view that we can talk and earn the right to discourse and engage in discourse as if there were an objective truth and we feel as if there were an objective moral truth and all of that, but at the very same time, it's little more than either an intersubjectively agreed upon sort of mm. system of value or indeed a value where we project uh, or commit to certain higher order attitudes and believe that these order attitudes are allegedly cognitivist or truth value but actually are just emotions and deeply rooted sensations and sentences. I suppose that's one way of offering a defense of non-cognitivism beyond Hare's prescriptivism. Yes, it is, um, but but is it a cop out? Is is it fundamentally different? Um, you know, you use the term projecting things onto the world. Well, you know that, of course, Mackey talked about projectivism um, in, in his critique of objectivism, and I think in a way Mackey was more uh, honest and direct than quasi realists in uh, saying this, because because if it is just the way we talk, then um, it's open to to challenge that and say, hey. I don't want to talk like this. I think it's misleading. I don't think we should be doing it. Um, um, and I think we should be more open about being moral skeptics, uh, as Mackey was. Um, uh, I don't think the quasi realists really have a sound answer to that. I suppose the answer that they could give is actually to say that, um, well, I, I, the, the problem or the intuitive and ease that Mackey or skeptics are tossing at them relies upon one very particular conception of what moral truth or morality could look like that is embedded implicitly with a view that there is this thing that is absolute morality and it is absolute to a very large extent and our inability to account for that sort of bindingness and forcefulness of morality and quasi-realism then is seen as a defect under that light but perhaps a rejoinder to that is to say if we emancipate our conception of morality and accept that it's little more than just a language game or an intersubjectively agreed upon system, then what the quasi-realists are defending there is just a brute psychological fact that maybe it is true that we can just say, I disagree, or I want to change the way discourse works, I disagree with your projection, but it's an empirical brute psychological fact that we don't, that we, all of us, or a largely an extreme majority of us, find murder impermissible. And Social intuitions are changing and altering and, and bending at the very same time. They're fluid, and it is that shift and deeply rooted intuitions that also change the contents and landscape of moral truth in that mm. same manner. Yeah, um, just just one thing about when you started, you used this term absolute. Um, I don't think saying moral truths are objective um, is the same as saying that they're absolute, and I think that can lead yeah. to confusion, right? Because yeah. because often people mean like an absolute moral rule: you must never kill an innocent yeah. person, yeah. right? So, um, so uh, I guess the question really is whether whether moral truths, in some sense, exist independently of us, this particular group of humans living on this planet now. Um, and you know, of course, you know, Mackey rejects the idea that they could be part of the fabric of the universe, and points out, as you say, how mysterious it would be that they could have this normative force, um, but, but Parfit's argument was that, well, they could be truths of reason in somewhat the same way as mathematical truths can be truths of reason. And that he didn't like the idea that they're uh, part of the furniture of the universe, and that's why he didn't like the term um, realism. Mm -hmm. He didn't call himself a moral realist, he called himself a, a non-natural objectivist. Um, because he wanted to get away from that idea, and you know, I think moral truths might be, might exist in the sense that suppose that uh, we were wiped out by one of these existential catastrophes, there was yeah. no life on Earth at all, um, but somewhere else in the universe uh, there are other rational beings, um, beings capable of thought, capable of understanding truths of reason. I think that they would eventually develop somewhat similar logics to ours, somewhat similar mathematical systems to ours. And I think they would also be able to see that suffering is bad, happiness is good, and that it's possible to take this broad point of view from which it's not just when I suffer that it's bad, 
but when any being suffers, that's bad. So it seems to me that actually it's what you're talking about there is an expanded conception of like mind dependence or some some degree of um, response dependent account where it's not humans' response, it's just any cognitive being capable of moral reasoning and moralistic rationalization becomes sort of the initiator or the member of that hypothetical community mm-hmm. and to the extent this community exists then there exists morality in response to that community's objective existence but i suppose my question is doesn't that actually tell more for uh, some degree of non-cognitivism still because if we accept to some degree that the existence of morality is conditioned upon these folks thought processes and thinking and minds and what they believe in then isn't that just as much likely to affirm a an emotions based or very deeply rooted sentiments based or attitudes based account of morality? No, I don't think so because I wasn't presupposing any particular emotions or sentiments. Now, when you describe it as a non-cognitivist view, but it's but it's it was the cognitive capacities of these beings that I was emphasizing, the fact that they're capable of reasoning, not the, not the fact that they they would have certain emotions. Right, but Presumably, you can be cognitive beings that produce non-cognitivist mental states, and it's the mental states that matter. So, it's, so you can imagine a world where all of these beings can feel, can interpret, and engage the world, but at the same time, they have no conception of such a thing as moral judgments. They don't resent anyone. They don't have moral attitudes. They don't. They just don't think morally at all. Then it seems very hard for me to then be persuaded to say there is morality in such a hypothetical world because just because they think in a cognitive manner doesn't mean they are. But I'm, no, but I'm making a somewhat different claim and that is that if they can think in a cognitive manner and they can put themselves in the position of others and see that uh, the suffering of others matters, mm-hmm. then if someone uh, wantonly and for no greater gain in happiness or, or reduction of suffering inflict suffering on someone else, there would be some sort of negative response, right? Now, I'm not sure you know, whether you want to call it an emotional one and could see it as a kind of cognitive dissonance, right, that idea. Um, so possibly I'm saying that, um, if you like, it would necessarily give rise to some emotions. Um, maybe that's the claim. But certainly the claim is not that beings evolve with certain emotions and therefore no. you get morality. Um, in, independently of having that cognitive capacity. That's very fair. I think where we could probably disagree upon is just to what extent do we think that having cognitive capacities naturally or to some extent causally entails or causes you to actually then develop those spontaneous natural mm. reactions that are, I think, right. pretty moral to some degree. But I'd like to sort of jump onto intuitions in a very different light, like, because it seems to me that a lot of your works and your defences in, say, um, you are your most seminal article in many ways about uh, Famine affluence and poverty it deals with the fact that intuitions are largely unreliable in many ways because of our existing status quo bias or sort of the, the, the later works from other theorists that supplement your view there. But at the very same time, the way I read your sort of um, drowning child analogy and example is I think this is probably one of the best, in my opinion, that is thought experiments out there because it pumps out the intuition in me that yes, I should go and save that child who's drowning. So I, I feel it feels to me that at the same time, you're not a pure skeptic towards intuitions, but you're also not a pure advocate of current intuitions. So, so the way I read your work is as an intuitionist expansionist or liberationist trying to change our intuitions and to change the way we look at the world. Do you think that's a fair diagnosis or do you think you're just generally skeptical of ethical intuitions? Look, I, I think it's a fair diagnosis in the sense of it's, it's a fair reading of the article if you take that article. Um, on its own. Uh, I think that uh, the article clearly does appeal to that particular intuition and then it invites the reader to say, okay, if I agree, I share the intuition that would be wrong to walk past the drowning child in the shallow pond, um, is it, am I doing something similar when I don't help people in, uh, who are in great poverty dying in other parts of the world. Um, and uh, so it allows that, that sort of argument. And of course, if that's true, then if somebody says, ah, okay, so now I understand the consequences, I guess that it wouldn't be wrong for me to let the child drown in the pond. Um, then the article, the, uh, that part of the argument collapses clearly, right? It needs a different argument to show that it would be wrong um, and maybe a, you know, 
general, more foundational utilitarian yeah. argument would show that. So, um, in the end, I think I could, you know, to, to bring that article within my larger framework and my views about intuitions, what I could say is, well, this is an article that is written to try to persuade many people to think more about what they should do for people in extreme poverty, and it's likely to work because most people will not want to reject the intuition yeah. about the drowning child in the pond. But I admit I haven't defended that intuition in that article, uh, and if somebody were to say, okay, so I reject the intuition, uh, I would need something different. That article is not... So more generally, do you think we should strive to limit the extent to which we use intuitions as a methodology and argumentation in philosophy, or do you think intuitions or pumping intuition still is a valuable and important aspect of doing philosophy? And I think it's a valuable and important aspect of doing philosophy because it often um, provides us with a sense of, um, oh, I need to think more, right? So here I have this intuition, but then that leads me to this consequence. Didn't really expect that consequence. Don't think I like that consequence. Something's gone wrong. And that, for very many people, um, is the initiative, the push that gets them into thinking ethically and philosophically about ethical issues. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't use intuition to argument, mm -hmm. but I am saying that uh, we, we should use them with an awareness that um, they are not simply data, they are not just, you know, it's not like a scientist who says, you know, ah, yes, I've seen the star in this position and, yeah. so, you know, whatever. Um, it's, it's something that we, we may actually end up rejecting. Uh, yeah. you know, if, the, if the arguments are strong enough, um, they are, as you said, they're formed in a whole variety of ways, there's a whole lot of critiques of them, there's, there's deeper psychological understanding of where they come from than um, there was 20 or 30 or 40 years ago when I first began working in philosophy. Um, and uh, in particular understanding that many of them may have an evolutionary origin and that that evolutionary origin does not justify them, but to some extent, at least in some circumstances, may d discredit them or debunk them. Um, I think those, those things are um, important uh, tools that we have to use when we use intuitions, we have to become aware of those. And I think that's, that's, that's very fair because actually we delve into this sort of discussion about the classification of what constitutes good or utile or desirable intuitions and not. You mentioned evolutionary psychology as a criterion or sort of evolution as genesis of this being a potential for disqualifying in some limited circumstances the intuitions that come from that. I suppose a critical theoretical um, challenge there would add that I think in many cases it, in, in, intuitions are constructed and constituted by our exposure and engagement with media, with culture, with texts, education and whatnot that embed within them distinctly ideological elements. So we might intuitively, like hypothetically if I were raised in a conservative society, I might find LGBT rights or homosexual marriage just intuitively uh, revolting in that hypothetical. Not, I don't think in any way it is, but I think that's just a hypothetical of course. So I, I guess then the question becomes, how can we tell and judge whether or not certain intuitions are desirable enough to be incorporated in our overarching reflective equilibrium, or how, how can we objectively rule certain intuitions out? Because you mentioned that we can seek and find and weigh up against new principles, against existing sort of backgrounds of intuitions and beliefs that we have. But what if that starting point or that background itself is produced by false consciousness or some degree of ideological hegemony that is problematic? Then how can we rely upon these starting points and intuitions when we're not going to really be able to correct them because we always have confirmation bias? Um, well, do we always have confirmation bias? Um, I've argued in uh, the book I co-authored with Katarzyna and Lazari Radek, The Point of View of the Universe, that... Um, Sidgwick's uh, axiom about uh, universal benevolence, which, in which he talks about taking the point of view of the universe and seeing that the, the good of any one individual is just as important as the good of any other, assuming that as much good can be obtained, um, that that is something that is not likely to have evolved. Um, so it doesn't have the sort of the bias of saying, oh, this is what our 
ancestors needed to think in order to survive and reproduce. And it doesn't, I don't think it has an ideological bias. I mean, some people have tried to argue with me that it, I don't know, that it comes from a sort of a, a Christian or Judeo-Christian perspective that other cultures would focus more on the importance of your own family or something mm -hmm. of that sort. But in fact, you find in a whole range of cultures, you find some thinkers, I, I would say some more enlightened thinkers who take this universal point of view. Um, so it's not really, <coughs> excuse me, it's not really restricted to any one culture. Uh, and it doesn't seem to serve any rich and powerful ideology. Um, so I, I think that that is a foundation that we can use to criticize some of the more particular mm -hmm. intuitions that we have that might, <coughs> sorry, um, that might well have been uh, the result of the culture or the ideology. That's fair. And I think just to close off this theoretical section, though, I would say there seems to be increasingly, um, there's a rising criticism of analytical political philosophy or analytical moral philosophy, and that's uh, channeled by the likes of, say, Stephen Mulhall, and also, uh, to some degree, a recent article was in London Review of Books by Mina Shinovash, and that a lot of moral philosophy seems to rely these days on abstraction and also hypotheticals and thought experiments that are disconnected from the real world. And, and the classic rejoinder, obviously, in defence is to say, ah, but it's just there to elucidate, it's there to isolate particular variables, it's there to test it out, and then we can apply it to the complicated quagmire of the real world. And I have a lot of sympathy for that defence as well. But I, I, and then the rejoinder to that is, though, that maybe sometimes morality is just so complicated and enmeshed in a quagmire that it can't be sort of like, I don't know, like biology, where you can test out how a bacterium reacts to a particular stimulus and then transpose that into a wider medium in which that bacteria grows. Unlike biology, you don't have that degree of transferability or fungibility in, in the way we do thought experiments and the way we apply these principles to the real world. Um, how do you feel about this challenge? Do you think it's a fair concern or do you think it's just a lot of unspecified posturing? Well, the claim that um, you know philosophers' examples are too abstract and need to be more in the real world is is not a new one. Um, you know, it goes back to the time when I was a student here in, in Oxford in the seventies. Uh, Iris Murdoch, for example, made that objection, and you know, to some extent, you can read her novels as looking at the tangled, complicated yeah. situation of the real world. But but does reading her novels give you a better moral understanding than thinking about some admittedly more abstract examples and trying to get clear on your principles and intuitions and then going back to the real world. Uh, I actually don't think so. Um, I, I don't know anybody who says, you know, really thinks the way to solve moral problems is to read a lot of novels about complicated moral situations. Because, you know, in, in a sense that's almost giving up. It's almost saying every situation is, is unique. You're never going to get to the same situation so you can't learn anything from this uh, to that, and then what are we going to do? You know, it's, we're, we're more or less back to a sort of moral particularism, or um, in bioethics, it's sometimes called a case study approach, where mm. you, you describe a, a complex situation in all its messy details, and you sit around the table and people say, hmm, I think you ought to do this, and someone else says, well, I think you ought to do that, and someone says, have you thought about this aspect of it? And you know, it can be useful, but in the end, I think you're, you're playing with your particular intuitions. Um, and, and they're strongly influencing your outcome. And as we were saying earlier, I tend to think that they're the ones that are more subject to, to biases of various kinds than the more abstract ones. So I definitely agree with you, and I'm very sympathetic to that, that claim as well. But just to play devil's advocate, I suppose the rejoinder is, when we sit around a table, uh, and this sort of goes back to Cohen's idea of public justification, there might be actually a view that when you sit around a table and you have a very case study approach or particularist conception of morality, you're far more capable of integrating and bringing in miscellaneous or heterogeneous facts that don't necessarily conform well to one top-down moralistic framework approach to how you analyse bioethics or these particular cases and instances, but precisely because you can bring in those details and talk about that at the discussion table, that deliberative approach yields a more emancipatory outcome that deals with those biases because you can't justify an outcome by saying, oh, I just personally believe that I don't think um, 
hypothetically animals have rights uh, when you are say engaging with someone or debating with someone on the table about whether or not you feel in this case the animal Bob or whatever Bob the cat has rights it, it seems that there is a way to like counteract that um, I suppose conservative or status quo deferring or status quo defecting um, intuition that pro intuition probably highlighted there without necessarily collapsing into anti-particularism uh, yes that's what Dancy would have said in response to your thought and particularism there. Yes, um, yeah, I, I don't know that I can say a lot about that. Um, simply, I'm not convinced that that's so. I, I've not seen discussions of that type that really have convinced me that people are free from particular biases and just bringing in certain principles that they're not really being forced to examine very closely. That's very fair. So I'm going to move on to uh, the final sort of two questions very quickly. Uh, what were your favourite memories at Oxford as a student? Like, what, what, what struck you as the most memorable part of your experience as a VFL student here? Well, I think, you know, so you have to remember that I, I come from Australia, studying at the University of Melbourne, uh, where we had read a lot of philosophers, and, and Oxford at the time was the centre of the English-speaking philosophical universe. So we'd read a lot of Oxford philosophers in particular. Um, but... You know, Australia being far away and travel being relatively more expensive than it is now, we, we hadn't really seen uh, many of these people. Occasionally somebody had come through. Um, but then here I am, I come to Oxford, um, I go to a graduate seminar where you know, a, a paper might be presented by somebody who I've read, you know, and there might be, say, I can remember seminars at which this is like more sort of political philosophy, at which uh, Ronald Rawkin was there, but his predecessor, H.L.A. Hart, was also taking part. Um, Honoré, who, you know, with Hart had written a book about causation in the law, was there. Um, and uh, uh, who else? Maybe Stephen Lukes was there. You know, was, was Jerry really, Cohen. Uh, Jerry Cohen. Uh, yes, well, I did. I attended classes at Jerry Cohen. Yeah, Jerry could have been there. I attended classes... Um, with Jerry Cohen about uh, analytical Marxism when he was developing what became Marxist theory of history, so that was very exciting. So there were a lot of this um, going on. There were a lot of, of really interesting work. And I should also um, say a special mention, this is rather different because this is someone who I had not read or even heard of before I came to Oxford. Um, but there was a, Derek Parfit was running a series of, well, it wasn't just Derek, it was Derek Parfit, Jonathan Cohen, and Jim Griffin were running a seminar on, uh, like, I don't know what it's called, problems in ethics or problems. So this was normative ethics. Parfit was presenting, it was the first I'd ever heard of this population issues, um, and that was a fascinating issue. Uh, Jonathan Cohen was reading, I think, a paper that became something like, does it make any difference whether I do it or not? The one about the, um, ah, yes. the one about the, the bandits who come and take one bean from a yeah. from hundred yeah. bowls from the hundred visitors and so on. Yes. Uh, that was a brilliant paper. Um, and I don't remember exactly what Jim Griffin was presenting, but, but it, it was a wonderful seminar and it really um, was more exciting in terms of normative. It, was, it wasn't then called applied or practical ethics, but it was getting close to that um, than anything that I had seen in Melbourne. Awesome. And what parting well, what words in general of wisdom would you give to someone who aspires to become an academic philosopher out there or, or a public philosopher? Uh, well, I, you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy field to get into. I think it's got harder to get into nowadays than it was uh, when I was here. Um, but uh, I think it's a very exciting and interesting field. And, I suppose if I have to give any words of wisdom, I would say try to avoid getting distracted into the, the small philosophical problems that might enable you to get a nice publication in, a, in an academic journal, but uh, really are only going to be read by uh, a few other philosophers who are you know, interested in that area. Try it. I think it's really important, especially if you're doing ethics, and that's, I guess, ethics or political philosophy, you know, those areas that make it. Where, where I see them as the kind of the intersection between the rest of society and philosophy. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you're in those areas, try also to communicate with a broader public. Um, not necessarily in everything you do, but in at least some of what you do. And that's exactly sort of <coughs> one of the reasons why we founded OPR, actually, to provide that opportunity to right. clarify and communicate ideas of thinkers and leading intellectuals like yourself uh, to the public. So thank you so much for your time, Professor. Good. It was a real pleasure.
Welcome, Ryan. Thanks. Good to talk to you.